Well, good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming. It's encouraging. But interestingly, I, you know, I, I felt as we came this to this evening, it didn't matter who was here, actually, whether there were half a dozen of you or whether the chapel would be full. The important thing is that you are here because God wants you to be here. And that's what prompted you to come. And I pray that tonight, God will reveal some of himself to you. That whether you be a Christian, you will be built up. Or whether you are not a Christian, that you will begin to see in very clear detail what it is you need to do to come into a relationship with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to whom we turn now in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, our God, how we praise you for who you are and for what you've done for us. That you accepted us with open arms, you drew us with cords of love, and we thank you that we who know you are saved, saved from so much. And we pray that if it be those who are watching online or who are gathered here that do not know you, reveal yourself to them in clear and unmistakable tones. May they writhe before you to deal with the agony of sin that they have, that they may come through to a saving knowledge of the King of Grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you will, all of us will, have to face him. Praise God that some of us can face him because we know him. Let us stand to sing this wonderful hymn. <laughs> So to the announcements for this week, uh, what, just one man, um, meeting to remember, and that's our prayer meeting on Wednesday. We really hope you can come to that means of grace. Do you know, I, I was remain, reminded 
of Pastor Budge this afternoon as I thought about that. He used to always say when you were taken into membership, always attend the means of grace. That means the place where God is present with his people and can minister to his people. So come to the prayer meeting if you can. Other announcements are that uh, please can you collect the cards that are in the foyer. Um, if you haven't been for a while, there may be some with your name on it. Please can the members uh, take their offering envelopes from the foyer as well. And then tomorrow, uh, between 10 and 2, is that right, Mark, tomorrow? It's a bank holiday. Please note the pastor is working in the church um, between 10 and 2 tomorrow. Please see Mark, because uh, I overheard a conversation this morning where he was saying, he can't see you in this time because I've got someone coming to see me. So please see him if you would like to. Advance notice, on Monday the 16th of January at 7pm, uh, there will be a meeting for those who are interested in coming into membership. Whether that is you are intent on coming into membership or whether you're just sort of interested, come along and find out what it's all about. And then, lastly, uh, a reminder, please, to remember there are many, many people who are in distress, as we've sung, um, at this time. In particular, we want to remember Ruth in the rawness of her bereavement uh, at the loss of her husband, Austin. Pray for her and her family. Uh, details of the funeral for Austin will be released in due course once they are known. And then we need to pray for uh, Teresa, Jackie Collins' sister. Uh, she has gone home, not weak, uh, strong enough to travel to Cardiff for further diagnosis. So clearly she's in a, in a bad place. And then the anxiety that comes from that to the family. So please remember Teresa, Jackie Collins and others. For there are sick, there are suffering, and there are many who are bereaved. So let's come now to the Lord for a time of intercession and prayer. Let's pray. Our Father God, you know our needs. Before we, uh, the thought gets into our mind to pray to you, to bring these dear folk into your concern and to bring your attention to them. Uh, this mechanism of prayer is something which is mysterious to us, but we praise you that you have used this as a vehicle for our engagement and understanding of you and your sovereign purposes and to see how we fit to engage with you to seek your face forgive us when our wills are distorted against yours for our desire is for things to be smooth and easygoing but lord that is not your purpose and we pray for those who are enduring the hardship, whether that be in physical suffering, uh, through Ill ailments that they are going through, through treatments they endure, we pray, Lord, that they will help them to firmly fix their eyes on you, to see your face, to seek your will, and to know your comfort. Lord, we don't understand you do not know how it is that you so bring your comfort, yes, through your Holy Spirit, but how your Holy Spirit works into our lives is, is a mystery again. But we are grateful recipients, and we thank you for all your wondrous plan of salvation and how you work through us. And then, Lord, we pray for those who have passed through waters of sad reflection, this last week for the person who is absent from the table absent from the home because they've gone on either to glory or to be in perdition we just want to pray for them and that lord in the memories that you will help them to turn their gaze to the future 
and to walk with you and to know your comfort and to know your blessing for there is much blessing to be had in you and then Lord finally we pray for the lost Lord no matter how difficult our circumstances are we know the reality of the future and the present that these people have we realize that in our society the sickness of our society is ever around us we read of it in the headlines where people take people's lives stabbed on a dance floor shot in a pub Lord, these families which are plunged into such deep grief with no hope. Oh Lord, how desperate is their situation. So we pray that somehow, through our witness, through our walk, through our conversation, that Lord, we will show forth the brightness of a new life in yourself. Be with those families that are in such hardship now. Just be with them and be close to them and lord we, we pray for our world it would be remiss of us not to and this time last year there was no conflict in ukraine but this year is so different for all those that are suffering that are stripped back of all the quality of life that we have come to depend on and we just pray for them as they eke out their existence without water, without electricity, without heat, without light. We just pray for them. And that, Lord, in their darkness, that you would bring your light. And for those who are inflicting this dreadfulness, we pray that they would turn from them, turn from their evil ways. Oh, Lord, we, we know that all things are working in your purpose and plan, and we have to trust you for that for we do not see what is happening but we pray that these conflicts will be resolved that the tensions will be gone oh, what we're praying for lord is your return for we know that when you come you will be the righteous judge and there will be no one and nothing that can stand in your way of having the right thing done and we just pray lord for the enemies of you we recognize that paul of Tars as saul of tarsus was one such who was gloriously saved and we do not know who will be saved and who will not but we just pray for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven amen well <clears throat> we come to our next hymn before the ministry of the word which is, I'm not skilled to understand. The hymn is there, doesn't he? Captivate, and capture our own ignorance and foolishness. We stand to sing, I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is my saviour.
When I pick these hymns, I have no idea of the emotional impact they will have on my heart when I sing them. Now, you're, you're in a bad way, aren't you, church? Mark was in, in bits this morning. I'm in bits this afternoon, uh, this evening. And actually, there is a dovetail of the message which God laid on Mark's heart for this morning and which God has laid on my heart for this evening. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. I dropped it back to the start of the chapter, but I could have gone right way back to chapter 1 and verse 3, because this is all about a narrative, all about a statement of encouragement to the Christian church, the leaders of the church, the ones that will take the baton forward, because the relay for Paul's leg of this race is coming to a close. The baton is being poised, it's being raised up to plant into the hand of the one that goes forward after him. So we have that in mind as we come now to explore his word. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation with, that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Finish well. Start well. Finish well. Start well. This was a like a mantra that we uh, that was brought into the school I taught at. And forgive me that most of my illustrations are taken from there because I spent thirty years in there, and I don't I didn't have much of a life outside of that. But the notion behind that is to finish your job, your term, whatever it is in, in your employment, well, means you start your next leg, your next career move well. Leave under a cloud, and you take that cloud with you. Finish well is about leaving the negatives behind. Our chaplain would always end his text messages or emails with the encouragement, go well. So it's not just about how you finish off and you tidy up or you sweep your dirt under the, under the rug. No, it's about running well in the process of your job or for me and this evening, your Christian walk. 
Christian, we have no better start in our walk with Jesus than we could ever hope for, design or manufacture. We invite Christ into our lives and Christ comes in to our lives. <laughs> what more could you want? Can you remember the elation you felt when you confessed your sins, you recognised that you were cleansed and that God's spirit now lives in you? Doesn't that make you cock per hoop? If that's the right term. I want to turn to the context. This is Paul's last trustworthy statement. We haven't got time to go through the previous four. But I want to focus on this, which is his last trustworthy statement. Now, this is the context of this is vitally important to your understanding of what the trustworthy statement is. The simplified, boiled down essence of Christian walk we have found through the trustworthy statements, none more so than of a person who knows he's condemned and that his execution is at hand. What am I going to pass on? What is of vital importance for the Christian walk as I have experienced it? This is what Paul is talking about here. Paul is about to die. His execution, they think, was about AD 66, 67. He was executed by the sword because that was a, a privilege that was granted to Roman citizens. The alternative, like Peter suffered, was to be crucified. This took place in the last year of Nero's reign, the last of the Julius Caesar's dynasty. He died in AD 68. Facts. Some of you might think, oh, if only Paul had just survived another year. Maybe he, no. It wasn't dependent on Nero. It wasn't dependent on anyone else or circumstances. His passing was in the hands of the Lord. So we'll review Paul's life. And a standard way of doing that is to look at what, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 27. So let's do it. If I've got my references right, yes. Paul, writing then, says, Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked uh, and have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. It's quite a list, isn't it? That's not bad, really if you're writing your CV to be appointed a bishop or something like that. Well, what a testimony. Paul wins the bragging rights. Hands down. You're welcome, Paul. I do not wish to compete with you. Yet, that only covers 20 years of Paul's life from conversion to the point at which he wrote uh, second, uh, first and second Corinthians. He still has 11 to 12 years to run. He still is going to be in hardship and danger. What we consider when we read a passage like that is actually the peak, the zenith, the top of what Paul went through. But as I was putting this together, I was impacted by, well, if that's the peak, what's below? If that's the top of the pyramid, what about the groundswell of what this man had to endure before that? 
One of the contexts we need to understand is that the church had thought that the return of the Lord would be immediate. That immediacy of Christ's return had not happened. And as such, many of the believers who pinned their hope on this started to become disillusioned. They started to think that all this effort they had put into living godly lives, not coveting and so on, was a waste of time. Why bother to keep going? That, of course, is a contradiction to the teaching of the Lord in Matthew 24, verses 48 to 51, which I'll praise thee, by saying that the re when the master returns and catches the servant not doing what he wants him to do, he will be cut in pieces, assigned to a place with the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Paul was dealing not just with external issues of opposition from the Roman authorities, the Jewish authorities, the Greek scholars and the like. He was, in fact, engaged in a battle within the church and for the church and for the development of the church. He had to contend with the humanity which had been restored to God for a walk with him, but still imperfect. Christian, look in the mirror. Watch for your wrinkles. Now, I deny that I've got wrinkles. I deny, I can't deny that I've got any hair on top of my head, but we tend to glamorize our view of ourselves. But there are problems and there are imperfections. And these imperfections worked out in divisions where people were opinionated enough to stand on their, what they thought was their revelation and to have arguments and disputes with their brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 1. Paul personally felt these problems. They were people, people that he'd worked with, people that he'd be involved in their conversion. And he was not wanting to see his children in dispute and anguish and argument. Maybe some of you over the Christmas period have had that within your own families. I don't know. It's quite probable. They say that the rate of divorce picks up over a Christmas period because people who normally don't spend much time together are forced to speak, spend much time together. Paul was faced with desertion. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, we see that the band of merry followers that Paul lived with and worked with through his ministry was winnowed away such that he alone was left. Deserted, isolated, things removed from you that you regarded as pillars of support. Paul knew all about that. Defiance. You see, if Paul were to come and stand in this pulpit and take over, no such chance, and I apologise, Paul would say, we would say, wow, that's what Paul says. We must take that on board and live by it. But not so in the early church. He was faced in, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 to 15, where he, his apostolic authority was rejected. People opposed him. People said, nah, it's only Paul, we don't have to do what he says. And so Paul faced the challenge. He isn't just moving in as a, an elite person, he is challenged. Because the message he brings wasn't acceptable. He suffered from fraud. People claiming to be Paul wrote messages to subvert the church by, to their own views. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses, verse 17. 
I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Now, why did he have to say that? Because other people were circulating letters, signing them as Paul, when they weren't Paul at all. Paul is, is getting this, this dreadful thing of saying, I didn't write that. What do you mean? That's an offence. If people say, Nigel said this, and I didn't, there are times when I think, oh, that would have been a nice thing to say. But there are times when I say, no, that's a downright lie. <coughs> and that's the tool of the father of lies, who spreads disinformation as a means of denigrating, drawing down his people, God's people. I've seen it happen in Christian circles too. Defamation of character. Misinterpreted. I didn't mean that. Paul, Peter, writing of Paul, in 2 Peter 3, 6, 16 says, he writes the same way in all his letters speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. At that point, as a younger Christian, I stopped and thought, hey, I'm not the only one. There are other people who find Paul's writings in his letters really hard. And it's not just me. Even the Apostle Peter says that. But then you go on to the next phrase, which says which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Taking Paul out of context, out of the, the words that he said that, mean, that can take a word to mean something totally different from what the intention was. Paul was fighting for the, for the faith of the church. And what a hard fight that is. And don't forget, he had personal difficulties physically. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9, he speaks of a thorn in the flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power, for my power is perfected in weakness. Paul was fronting, was fighting on a whole load of other fronts. Interestingly, I think Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives a sort of medical diagnos diagnosis of what Paul may have been suffering from. I think it was something to do with his eyes, as I recall what the doctor said. In summary, you can see why this is important to understand what we're going to come on to look at. Paul lived his life for the Lord. This is an experienced soldier in the Lord. What does his armour look like? I sometimes wonder that. What does our armour look like? But this is a different sermon, so forgive me. Is it bright and shiny and gleaming as if it's just come off the shelf after the, the blacksmith's yard? I sense that Paul's, um, Paul's armour would like broken and tattered and bruised and bashed in, certainly not something you would want to pick up. So, the last trustworthy statement. What is it? And the second half is not as long as the first half. I encourage you. Verse 11. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we also live with him. Start well. Begin in the Christian life is to die to ourselves. If we have died with him. What does that mean? The old self, the old ways, the ways of the world we have abandoned. We are now, if we are Christian, to walk in new ways. Consider the decision we made when we became Christian. 
We were convicted of our sin. We were driven to the cross. We appraised this life that we were brought up in as vile and a depressing prospect. How can we go on? And so we are driven to him. We are driven from a black and white existence and sufferance for the most part into the prospect of a colourful life that is presented in all its fullness. Live with him. Matchless. To live with him? To have him in your house? To have him standing beside you? In all your circumstances, in all your situations? Through the challenges that we face, through the choices we have to make, which direction to take, which obstacles are presented before us, they're all lived out for a Christian in prayer. The reality is that in the, those desperate times of prayer, we are also in despair, and thick darkness surrounds us, and the tunnel seems unending. Yet, by his grace, we come through. We come through because somehow, outside of our control, he brings us through. Friend, Christian, realistically, is there any other way to live? Realistically, how do people manage without him? I can remember as a manager with imponderable problems in front of me, questions I had no clue to. And I can always remember sharing with, with brothers in Christ, how on earth do people manage without him? I got, I've lived as a Christian since I'm 18. I'm almost 50 years old as a Christian. How did people manage? Most of my life has been lived with Christ. I have no idea, concept. I can't empathize with you, non-Christian, wherever you are, because honestly, I don't know. But I do know what Christ has done for me and has brought me through. Verse 12. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. The reality of living as a Christian can, in fact, be doubly challenging. To be a Christian is to repent and to go his way. And therefore, we as Christians are going against the flow, direction and movement of society. Our stand for Christ is, re is met with increasing indifference. We share our faith, our testimony with our families and our loved ones. I can remember sharing my testimony with my parents and my family when I was a new convert. Sometimes I was met with indifference. Yes, yeah, so what? Sometimes with antagonism. You think more of your Christian family than you do of us? Ridicule? Oh, yay, there you go again, praying, praying, praying. What good does that do? Malevolence. Let's do things to antagonize him, to wind him up. To deployment of evil against us. All of which, actually, bizarrely, can lead to our advantage. Because through these battles, through these temptations, through these difficulties, we can grow as Christians. We shouldn't see our assaults as a badge of honour, a bragging right in a fellowship of competition. I well remember working with Open Doors in the years gone by at the time of the fall of communism. I remember hearing stories 
of Christians in Russia, in the churches of Russia, who resented the fact that the persecution was ceasing. Why? Because their testimony was inferior to those who had come through the harsh, brutal persecutions the people had gone through, and that somehow they were lesser Christians. And somehow they had to go out, be obnoxious, so that they could gain some crudence, some kudos, by being persecuted, when actually they were just being silly and stupid. No. There are no bragging rights here. Rather, what is taking place through the things that come at us is the transformation of our hearts and minds to be made into his likeness. This is what Christ promised, surely. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Do you recall, some of you who are old enough, there used to be a band, a sort of plastic rubbery thing, with the letter initials WWJD. What would Jesus do? We wore it on our wrists, next to our watches, because it kept reminding us that we are called to a different way. To live out our lives in a fashion and manner that our Saviour lived out here on earth. We are living out a victory. Let's not take our eyes fully on the problems, but let's look at it from the reverse side, of God's side. We are living out his victory that he established beforehand in the face of all the challenges and despairs that he faced, and we can emerge victorious by trusting in him. Our resolution must be to press on in him, with him, and for him. But now we come to Anasti. Anasti. 12b. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Why is it that we fall back? Why is it that we stand back when we face persecution and hardship? I share personal testimony here. Expediency. Expediency is the ticket to get out of the furnace of trial. To compromise, to take the pressure off. The words that come to your mind are these. I am sure the Lord will understand. He knows what I'm going through. And he knows what I can cope with. And he knows what I can't cope with. And we reason ourselves out of the problem. I'm sure he will pardon my transgressions. Yet the deviation of the pathway that we take to our contentment is really a pathway to emptiness and to be spiritually, to be spiritually barren. The heavens will become as brass in prayer the word that we read becomes lifeless and there is an absence of peace in our hearts and the presence of discontentment overwhelming. Expediency is no spiritual alternative. Parking our faith for convenience leads to the wreckage of our lives. Surely, I am speaking to people who have walked with the Lord for many years and know exactly what I'm talking about. That we have failed the Master so many times, and yet so graciously he brings us back. Now, I'm not condemning those people who do fall away. That's not my job. My job is to walk with him independently to encourage those who are not walking with him. 
One of the concerns I have is that sometimes in brochures like Open Doors, we only give the victory side of things, or that the person is continuing in hardship. But I was struck by a little passage in Brother Andrew's God Smuggler book. And I'd like you to join with me in this illustration. Take your hands, look at your palms of your hands. Look at the palms of your hands. Now turn your hands over. And imagine you have no nails. Your nails have been tortured from you. That is what some Christians have gone through. I remember Andrew saying about a priest that he'd met and wondered why he had compromised. And the man took out his hands from behind him and showed him. He didn't need to say a word. And Andrew realised and walked away. How could, would I have coped in that torture chamber with that degree of pain and suffering? That man could not endure I'm sure the Lord will minister to him. Or the father who sits in a torture chamber, chained, with his eyes kept open. Why? Because his wife is being beaten, his children are being beaten before him and tortured. Tell us what we need to know. Recant your faith. And if they do, who am I to condemn them? I don't know how I would cope. What I do know is that my Lord could bring me through, would bring me through, will bring me through. Yet the words of Jesus are very plain. Matthew 10, 33. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Paul isn't inventing these terms. He's using what the Lord has actually said. It's a bleak prospect, isn't it? As we face the new year, what challenges are coming our way? Clueless. I can't tell you. What I can tell you is that there will be no position, no temptation that will befall you that the Lord has not endured before you and will bring you through. The positive is in verse 13. If we are faithful, faithless, he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. Where well, my response in the Christian way is shattered and broken, as often is the case, he takes over. He stands alongside. My faith is all in him and none of me. I'm not going to be able, I won't stand here it would be contemptible for me to stand here and say, hey, look at me. I'm going to face this opposition. I'm going to face this difficulty. And I will be triumphant. Rubbish. I rubbish myself if that is my arrogance. Because it is he in me that works the word of God out. God knows us individually. He made us. We can cope with him. And actually, we can achieve far beyond what we consider to be our limits. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Oh, no, I can't do that. But yet, with him, we can come through. Our hindsight as experienced Christians should encourage us that we can move forward in him. But this is not to diminish the warnings of this passage of scripture. And I come back to the words of our Lord in Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, the end day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then Jesus, I, will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Words of protest are hollow 
and contradicted by the one who knows all things, including the determination of our hearts. They are imperative. Our importance is to get right with God because that is in now is the outcome which faces us. Unless we are right with him, we're wrong with him. And being wrong with him is not the place to go. Because it determines not just the next few years, it determines eternity. Conclusion. The reality of what Paul experienced is a matter of degree, the nth degree. All Christians experience some of what Paul endured, all true believers, that is. Paul suffered much, and a fulfilment actually of what the Lord disclosed to Ananias about Paul in Acts 3, verses 13 to 16. The Lord would reveal to Paul what he would go through. And I believe the Lord reveals to each of us that walk with him what we will go through. Very strange. A thought comes to, to me when I'm ironing, and I think, whoa, where's, what's that all about? Preparation. Preparation for what is to come. Mercifully, it's all given in time. If the Lord had said to me on my conversion, Oh, Niger, I want you to do blah, 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 and this is going to be your life. Blah, 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 blah. I'd have said, thanks a bunch, appreciate that, I'm off. But he reveals to us in measures that we can cook with, that we can chew, bite size. The encouragement to us in Paul is that he is an example of what the Lord can achieve through a human vessel. I was so thrilled to read of Brother Andrew's testimony in the obituaries that were written of him. And this one stood out for me that he believed that he was no different to any other Christian. His difference was he trusted in Christ to take him the next way and responded to Christ's invites to do that extra thing. We, as Christians, and I, advise, I, I suggest to you, I implore you, Read some old biographies of the Christian saints. Read what they went through. Hudson Taylor. Any, uh, Wang Ming Dao, a Chinese Christian. So many. Read them. Put it on your list of, bi of things to do this year. Read a biography. And then you will see encouragement and exemplar of what I'm talking about, that God will lead you through. So at the start of this new year, I'm not asking you for a resolution. That is not, I, I, I hate New Year's resolutions, not because I'm, it shows that I'm a failure and I can't keep up with what I've planned to do, but I do enjoy and empathize with the thing that the Lord tells me to do to read this, to read that, to develop into this, to go there as I go on my walk with him. The whole journey of each of us as Christians in this life is surely condensed into this. We need to move closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. What other objective do we have? It is total with him. Achieving victory over sin and the flesh, whether by brokenness or moulding to be pliable in his hands, maybe through this process, as the early Christians experienced, 
we can point them, non-Christians, to him. Whether that's friends or family, that we have that they may see that we have something that they lack, i.e. the presence of the Lord. Start well. Finish well. Remember that start, I said about finishing well, to start well. No, no. Start well, that's our position in Christ. Finish well. We started well in him, let us finish well in him. In the next couple of chapters, Paul writes, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Wow, what a testimony this is. Please, God, that it would be my testimony. Please, God, that it would be your testimony. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me, or not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. Amen. Lord, in our frailty, we are so aware of our shortcomings. Um, give us strength, give us courage, give us perseverance, give us all that we lack, for we lack so much, that we may follow you in fullness of faith, that we may be effective for the extension of your kingdom and glorify your name. Amen. In closing, we come to sing our last hymn, an ancient hymn, hundreds of years old. Be thou my vision, Lord of my heart. Be all else but naught to me, save that thou art. We stand to sing. Be thou Yeah.
difficult, isn't it? It's a hard hymn to sing. It's not Rian's fault. That was lovely. Thank you, Rian. But interestingly, by stumbling over the words, we are actually trying to fit them in. And may God grant that we might fit them into our lives. Now with the grace. May a dying Saviour's love and a risen Saviour's power and an ascended Saviour's prayer and a returning Saviour's glory be the comfort and joy of your heart. Amen.